Hello everyone and welcome to the last uh, Turing lecture of our summer series. Uh, we are delighted to have you all here and we're even more excited to uh, uh, move into our new space which will be happening uh, soon. So this is the last lecture in this space. And those of you that are listening through um, the live streaming, uh, remember that at the end you can also ask questions using the command, the comment box under the, the video. Okay. So, uh, we are delighted to have Mike West today with us here. Uh, Mike has done a lot of the pioneering work in uh, Bayesian statistics, in regression, in Bayesian nonparametrics, in uh, uh, time series, uh, in uh, many, much of the foundational work. And he also led the development of the Duke University Department of Statistics, which, as many of you know, is one of the uh, leading Bayesian departments in the world. And I was lucky enough to do my postdoc with him uh, at Duke. So he's going to be talking about his latest work on structured dynamic graphical models and scaling multivariate time series methodology. Uh, without further ado, Mike, thank you very much for joining us. I look forward to it. Thank you, everybody, for coming um, <coughs> to a statistics research seminar um, that has been uh, uh, morphed into a Turing lecture. <coughs> so it's, uh, as Johanna said, I work some in time series, and that's the context of this talk. And I've been doing that for 35 years, among other things. And the talk is about work in the last year or two that represents a change in my thinking. Uh, how many of you are statisticians? All right, machine learners? Well, you're statisticians, put your hands down. <laughs> <laughs> so, and everybody's Bayesian. All right, so we've, we've, we've all lived in this world for many years of models becoming increasingly customized to the problem context, uh, more complicated models, higher dimensional models, uh, because we're very cavalier about being able to fit models. We can compute. We have the technology. Okay, and I've been as enamored of that for 25 years as, as most people, uh, but I'm starting to get off the, the, the drip, because in a number of areas, and this work represents one of those areas, I gave a talk at the Newton Institute in the network program last week, uh, which is another area where the same principle is being practiced by, by myself and, and people who work with me and others, um, because we've hit, we've hit a ceiling, not in terms of computation and technology and the ability to fit and explore but the ability to understand. This talk is about very simple models, linear state space systems, linear systems, discrete time, uh, state space models, uh, univariate models, which I was involved in fitting and understanding and using when I was a PhD student. We can understand them. We know how to fit them analytically fast. Uh, but when we go to 500 or 5,000 dimensions, and the, the examples, we work a little bit in, with financial indices and, and, and stock data and things like that. That's part of the, that's the main example, the only example today. Uh, but there are examples in other fields. Um, the imperative in, in, in time series modeling is, is not only to be careful and thoughtful about individual series and how one builds predictive components for them, but the cross series structure, the contemporaneous structure volatility, multivariate volatility modeling. And that's, that's what I'm alluding to, well, very specifically when I say we sort of hit, hit a barrier. We've hit a ceiling in, in, in scaling models. And there's been a proliferation of multivariate volatility models in the last couple of decades, most recently in the last five or seven years, particularly in the Bayesian world, that are just horrible. They're just hopeless. They don't generate, they're not processed model, mathematical models of, of data that we see when you look at, at what they're realized um, um, synthetic values look like, okay? So I'm giving it up. I'm giving up Markov chain Monte Carlo, at least for this afternoon. I'm certainly giving up sequential Monte Carlo, and I've sworn off that a few times ago, a few times, but I've done it now three times, and that's it. Doesn't work, doesn't work. Uh, that's a separate topic. Um, <clears throat> and so we'll, we'll, there's basically one principle underlying this. The mathematics is trivial. There's some technicalities that are very specific, linear Gaussian systems. But there's one principle that I want to, uh, want to expose. There's some papers 
and the, it's the principle of decouple, recouple, as we call it. Um, and um, and this is, uh, this is uh, one of the several contexts where it's, it's grown. So here's our multivariate series. We'll have m equals 401. It's a very s simple problem in a sense, computationally, mathematically, okay? It's a very important problem in terms of its applications. This is uh, stock data. Um, so these are our scalar time series, and we'll be in finance today. We've got some papers where we've got data in the neurosciences, and uh, some of our, our most interesting work currently is in internet kinds of data where the sky is the limit in terms of M, really. And so the notion of graphical modeling comes in very, very quickly. I mean, you have to break things up into little pieces to scale, okay? Um, you know, we've been doing that for hundreds of years. So the aims of the, 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 the sort of work that underlie the just summary, brief summary today <coughs> are to scale up. And so let's think about finance. It will be 400 stocks in the Standard & Poor's 500 index over a period of years. Daily data. Running ahead in time, day by day. I just checked the, uh, the markets a minute ago, just opened in, in, uh, in New York. Uh, sequential analysis. And as soon as you see that, you know, oh, Markov chain Monte Carlo is out of the window. And then there's all of this lovely stuff in sequential Monte Carlo, you know, which has a major footprint in the, the Anglo-French axis uh, locally as well as in other parts of the world. And, and a lot of my friends who, 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 and, and co-authors in that area um, have done phenomenal work, but it's methodologically very challenged in terms of scalability, uh, for one. Um, so what we're going to be doing is thinking about a different way of operating that says, well, look, let's take univariate models. We know, we, know, we know how to build univariate models. We've been doing that with mathematics, simple mathematics for years. Kalman filtering, right, with frills. And if we had just univariate models, we, we have the opportunity then to look at them one at a time in parallel and customize the predictive development of each of the models, okay? And as long as we're, we're a little bit careful, we'll, we'll just do Kalman filtering. So if we want to do fast internet data sequentially in time, for monitoring kinds of problems, so where's the anomalies, that kind of thing. Um, that's what we'd like to do. But then in all of these problems, whether it's networks or, 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 or finance, I mean, the action in portfolio applications of financial forecasting models is in the cross-series contemporaneous relationships. It's the co-volatilities, the co-movements, and how they fragment into lots of different dimensions that really drive the, uh, the, the decisions. So we want to come back and make sure that whatever we do, if we do take a simplistic view of M sim simpler problems, that we're able to bring them back together and recouple. So that's decouple, recouple. So let's get the example <coughs> to fix ideas. So I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes just talking about standard time series. Nothing new here. New to some of you because you haven't seen it but no real research advances. Well, some small, a few PhD theses, but, but nothing conceptually um, challenging, even if it is new for you today. So here we have 400 stock prices on a daily basis. This is Citibank, AT&T, eBay, Bank of America, and GE, okay, in some order. And this is daily data. data. And I'm gonna be, start out just, just thinking about, well, how is this going? How are these individually going? This is the history of time up until today. And I'm standing here forecasting tomorrow. And I've got information, some bold face vector of information, the Citibank. And then I've got other stuff that I can't predict, volatility, residual noise, innovation, whatever you want to call it, stochastic stuff. I'm a Bayesian, so it's just all of the stuff that's left when I condition on XT, X1, all right? It's how poorly, I, it's the it defines the limits to my ability to forecast. So in X, for example, we would have everything we want to know, say about Citibank, okay? Um, anything we want to bring to bear in building the model, and, and that often in, includes lag values, you know? Daily stock prices have momentum, FX has momentum. Two, three day time varying patterns uh, that, 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 that build up momentum. So for example, for Citibank tomorrow, we might choose to take the last couple of days on its price and then add in some lag values of say AT&T and perhaps the Bank of America, okay? Select some useful predictors, okay? And then we'll have some other things I call Z, which is other information, all of the insider information, 
OK? And whatever else you want to put into the model. So this is just regression. It's dynamic, OK? It's, it's a sequential time series. That's just regression. We'll do the same thing for each of the 400 series with uh, customized models. And they, of course, will each have their own idiosyncrasies. Okay? So this, in our throughout today, these are just a set of linear regressions with time-varying parameters and volatility in the residuals that shows up as a stochastic uh, phenomenon. OK, so this graphical structure here, the lagged values of any one of the y series can be, a predict can be predictors of, of Citibank. OK, but you don't want many of them. There's not much action in these lag values. There's some, and it can be very important from the point of view of forecasting accuracy and characterizing volatility. But you want sparsity there. You don't want all 399 prices yesterday on all of the other series, or all 400 of them. Okay? And you certainly don't want you know, a big bag over the last few days. You want some sparsity. So there's forward connections, directed graphical structure. Now let's look across time. Let's We've done that, so now let's look across time, at time t, and, and play the following game. <clears throat> Suppose I knew the price of the Bank of America stock at 4 p.m. New York time tomorrow. That would probably help me think about predicting the price of the Citibank stock at 4 p.m. tomorrow. Okay? And maybe some of the others. Okay? Not all 399, but some of them. Okay, so I'd like to begin to tie things together. I'm thinking now about volatility, co covariances and, 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 and other measures of relationships, multivariate relationships across the series at each time. Okay? So that's contemporaneous coupling. For example, I might, I might take AT&T and the Bank of America, their prices, and say, if I knew them, tomorrow's prices, I want them. I want them to predict Citibank. And then I, I follow the same logic as I go through each of these decoupled series down to the bottom of the list there. I'm going to use the, the notation here, boldface, because it could be a vector. Uh, SP for simultaneous parent. Simultaneous, because contemporaneous parent, if you like. So that's some of the other series at the same time, and they will be sparse. Okay? So all I'm doing is thinking about customized univariate models decoupled. Well, then we get into uh, a graphical structure as well, but there's this simultaneity coming in, and there may be some circularity coming in. Because uh, I've got an example here. So AT&T tomorrow predicts Citibank, and Citibank predicts AT&T. So it looks like a directed graphical structure, but it's not acyclic. Okay? So I've got to care about that. I didn't ask about the economists and the econometricians. There you go. So simultaneous equations. Okay. This is dynamic uh, uh, systems of, of simultaneous dynamic uh, linear models. Just a bit of notation. And so this is my uh, j equals 1 is, uh, is Citibank. Um, it's customized predictors with a linear regression. And phi is a time-varying set of linear regression parameters for Citibank when j equals 1. Then with my notation for the simultaneous parents, I'm going to have a set of linear regression coefficients on the unknown tomorrow's prices of those simultaneous parents. And then I'll have the residual with some volatility model in, in there. It's all conditionally linear, conditionally Gaussian. So these will be zero mean Gaussians with time-varying volatilities and some standard volatility process that allows us to capture fluctuations, uh, standard model, it's the, the basic model that's been used for 45 years, um, but is analytically tractable so we can do forward analysis and forecasting very fast. Let me move to a vector matrix notation. I'll call this term uh, the mean mu j, and I'll put those mu's in a vector, put the y's back in its vector, in their vector, put the idiosyncratic terms in a bold face zero mean multivariate, conditional multivariate normal vector with a diagonal variance matrix. So the simultaneity component comes in here. It's a square matrix gamma, where these, these gammas fill up that gamma, these, these lowercase fill up the uppercase, multiplied by the y vector tomorrow itself. So this gamma looks like this. When j equals 1, I've got 
two simultaneous parents. What did I say? I had AT&T and Bank of America. So gamma 1t is a two vector. So extend it to a 400 vector with by padding out with zeros. Gamma 1t and gamma 2t are in very relevant positions. Okay? So this gamma matrix looks like this. It's 400 by 400, zeros down the diagonal, and it's sparse. Most of it is zero. There are just a few pieces that are non-zero where I've identified these simultaneous parent sets. Not symmetric they, they, uh, at all. Okay. Everybody got that? Let me just step back. It's just setting up notation. Any questions? We're all good with this? Bin, always got a question. Does the YT on the right hand side also have the same index? That's YT, yes. So there has to be a zero down there. That's just, that's just taking these things together and recognizing this set of simultaneous relationships. So Bin said that this is a set. So now I'm going to move that to this side. Okay. And you're just going to tell us what's independent of what in the system. I'm, I'm going to finish that off. I just told you, I'll say again. So this is a set of conditionally independent. This, this will have a Gaussian distribution with a diagonal variance matrix. Okay. So they're independent across the across rows. Across the rows, yes. Oh. Okay. So I'll, I'll show you that up here in a second. Let me just finish the story on gamma. So think about gamma with that picture. Blue means, excuse me, blue means non-zero. That's where the, the elements of these vectors lie. And they have some values, but blue means non-zero and time varying. And white means nothing, zero. Okay, so gamma looks like this, it's sparse. As I said, in response to the question, this is a set, we're just taking each of these series and modeling them separately, conditionally independent. Talking about the independent, I mean, if, if that model is correct for a single se series, then the mu's are determined as the residual in that series. But, I mean, so that doesn't mean to say they're going to be independent across. That's the, the model. The model is one where they are assumed okay, so, independence. So, so, what, so it doesn't, I mean, I'm thinking of, say, a, a lattice model where the residuals will certainly not be independent of each other typically. That could be true. Here they are, the, the, the model is set up as a set of independent models. Oh, okay. Simultaneous equations. You're perfectly entitled to assume that, but I'm struggling to understand what the implications no. are. The conditioning set is what? What do you condition on? Oh, here this is conditioned on all of the past y's and the values of these state vectors. Okay. And contemporary, also the one. And the, so everything we know if, is if running I, I, When I look at the first series, I need to know the contemporaneous values of its parents to use this model, okay? So let me now resolve these questions, <laughs> or what's really behind these questions, and do what Bin wanted to do immediately, and move from what econometricians call the structural form of a set of simultaneous equations to the reduced form, where y is only on the left-hand side, okay? And this then gives us uh, the dynamic regressions then for each of the terms are mixed up a little bit by this gamma matrix. Today we're more interested in the multivariate volatility. So this stands for a Gaussian, multivariate Gaussian in 400 dimensions with zero mean, where the precision matrix, the, the inverse of the, of the, of the variance covariance matrix, the natural parameter, the object that car carries all of the information about conditional independencies in the multivariate distribution has this product form where this is this diagonal matrix here inherited from the assumption of independence in the specified model. And I minus gamma comes in then pre and post multiplying uh, that diagonal with a transpose in front. Okay? So what we have here is a structure in the precision matrix of the residual of the volatility component of a multivariate time series that when gamma looks like this, looks like this. This is omega, the precision matrix. The variance-covariance matrix may well be full, no sparsity. It may be sparse. In, in very sparse cases, it will be. But typically, we're working it with this picture in mind, lots of sparsity. We want some simultaneous predictors of each series to capture short-term movements in co-volatility, co-movements. Uh, but we don't want all of them. So we'll get a sparse precision matrix as a result. So the conditional Gaussian distribution of the y vector at each time, given the states and given the history of the series, is simply some 
predictive regression component, time varying predictive regression component, plus a residual which has a structured, a highly structured volatility matrix. And by construction, you know, it's a valid positive definite symmetric matrix. We've recoupled to get this full joint distribution. Okay. Uh, for those of you that don't know, in a Gaussian distribution, in the full joint distribution, conditional independence structure is characterized by the pattern of zeros. Okay. In the graph on 400 nodes, an edge exists between node i and node j if and only if there's a non-zero value in this, in this array. Okay, so to use models, we need to do more. Um, we need to think about, well, there are these state vectors in each of these decoupled models. We've got to specify some structure on them. This is where I'm just going back to simple linear systems, simple state space models. Statisticians have tended to call them dynamic linear models for historical reasons. Engineers and econometricians tend to call them state and applied mathematicians, uh, state space models or, or linear systems, time varying linear systems. So last bit of notation, all I've done is taken those two components, the XT component, the exogenous predictors, the independent variables, lag values for each series, and the simultaneous predictors and put them into one vector, okay? And the theta vector then is a state vector for the linear system, for the dynamic linear model for series J. And these will have linear Markov, first order Markov, uh, linear Gaussian evolutions, okay? There'll be a, a state evolution. In the example, these will just be multivariate random walks, okay? So for the volatility, as I mentioned earlier, we'll have a, a particular volatility model that has, uh, is again a first order Markovian model. Coupled with this, it puts us in a world of extended Kalman filtering. Analytic, fast forward computations, all of the distribution theory is conjugate, priors, at time, t, at time t for the states and volatilities evolve to conjugate priors, they get updated to conjugate posteriors, predictions are analytic, et cetera. Okay, so let me spend uh, a couple of minutes talking about a special case, nothing new. Okay, but just worth pointing out, so it will be new to you, some of you, because you haven't seen it, and some of you who have seen it may not quite have seen it the way that, 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 that you might be interested in seeing it. We call these dynamic dependency network models uh, for a particular reason. The, the term dependency network was introduced by David Heckerman and his groups at uh, the Applied Statistics and Machine Learning Group in Microsoft in the USA uh, a number of years ago, um, 95 or so, for a slightly different context, but that's why we decided this was the right term for these models. So these are models, this is the same picture, <coughs> um, but with a different set of random numbers. And gamma happens to be upper triangular. Somebody decided they wanted that particular sparsity pattern, that particular set of simultaneous parents, okay? So gamma looks like this. It could be lower triangular. Just reorder the rows and it's the same thing, okay? So in this case, in this case, this decomposition, I minus gamma has ones down the diagonal, is upper triangular, so this is an LU symmetric, uh, a decomposition of a symmetric matrix is a Kolesky decomposition. Okay. And I say popular there, I'll give you some references later. In the last decade, this is nothing new, in the last decade in, in econometrics, in econometric time series for macroeconomic forecasting, policy contexts in particular, but also in, in financial econometrics, this has become quite fashionable to take a covariance matrix and model elements inside the Kolesky decomposition rather than trying to invent more elaborate creative models of, of bigger and bigger covariance matrices on the space of positive definite matrix matrices directly. It's much easier to go to the Kolesky and look inside while well, you can take free the, the, the Kolesky elements below the diagonal, in our case above the diagonal. You, you can put any model you like on them. And that's really what we've sort of backed into here in this special case. 
But it's a special case that you have to think hard about when you want to use these models because the order of the series is relevant. If we, if we had this structure for our time series, then Citibank can have any simultaneous parent from the set of 399 series remaining. The second series, AT&T, can have any of the 398 listed below. Citibank cannot be a simultaneous parent of AT&T. And as you go down, you've got more and more constraints, fewer and fewer potential simultaneous parents. So the order of the series you lay down is critical. You have to think hard about it. One of the reasons in low dimensional macroeconomic modeling this is nice is that it really does segue perfectly with structural economic modeling. Economists know what drives the economy. They each have their own theory of the economy. <laughs> So they write down equations that says, well, if we do fudge around with the central bank um, constraints on how banks can, can uh, on the rates at which banks can, can borrow and, and lend money, um, then that is causal on, intra on uh, inflation and unemployment and et cetera, et cetera. Okay? If we play around with M1 money supply, that is causal on these other things. So they build these sort of triangular systems in their heads. Some of them get Nobel Prizes for them. Uh, most of them don't. <laughs> uh, so the order of series being relevant can be a very good thing. But when it comes to 140 EEG channels on probes on a scalp, or 18,000 nodes in, a, in an internet-based uh, study, there's no way in hell you can even think about that. It, it, it doesn't make sense. And, you know, there are many, you know, M factorial is a big number, even when M is 400. So the idea of saying, well, look, let's use this model, but learn a little bit about what's a good ordering and what's not. Uh, you won't go very far uh, with that line of thinking. So that's a problem in, 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 in terms of general methodology, and that's really what this talk is about, avoiding this problem. But let me finish the story here with dynamic networks, uh, dynamic dependency networks, <clears throat> be because of this ordering, you've got this triangular array, the series at the bottom can only point up. You've got a directed graphical structure with no cycles possible. And the usual notation is parents in a directed acyclic graph rather than simultaneous parents. So the PA means parents. Um, and they can only lie below series J in this list. <clears throat> and the triangularity then in terms of the model, this conditional Gaussian model, factorizes compositionally. Why JT, given everything on the, on the, on the right, right hand side, has some conditional normal distribution that depends in particular on its parents and all of the other things. I just dropped them out of the notation for clarity. And this is simply a direct, specific, a a direct factorization of that joint multivariate normal distribution. Okay, that's the directed acyclic graph. So it's easy to fit these models. You just fit them in parallel. You can do analytic Kalman filtering style computations each step, and then for forecasting more than one step ahead, of course, you can't. There are some analytics available, uh, mainly use simulation. Um, it's, this is not really new. It's, it's new in, in the generality, but Jim Smith at Warwick University and Catriona Queen, who was a student who's been at the Open University for many years, got into, into some of this thinking uh, years ago with a couple of uh, a series of papers. Uh, under the name of multi-regression DLM, but not, not quite as general as this, but that's, that's really what it is, okay? Are there, who are the PhD students in the room? I mean, current PhD students who haven't got a PhD yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, you know, next time you do something, if it's worth writing down, and you think it might be a chapter or a paper, give it an imaginative name. I'll give you another example in a minute, but. Dynamic dependency networks is one such uh, example, okay? Uh, it's, there are some big differences with respect to the, the, the progenitor multi-regression DLM. I'll give you a really nice example. I'll give, the machine learners will like the next example. <coughs> okay, so we do simple analysis uh, for, for, uh, for, for fitting these models. One step learning, filtering through time, common filtering with frills, Bayesian volatility frills and other things. And then for forecasting, so that, that's decoupled, for forecasting more than one step ahead, well, there's some analytics, but synthetic futures is, is the way 
is the way to forecast. You, you forecast the last series from its model, which doesn't depend on any of tomorrow's values. And if you forecast by simulation, then when you go up one in the chain, you've got those sampled values of, of y m t, and you plug them in to forecast y m minus one t, and you recurse up the triangular system to get full joint, to get synthetic futures from the full joint distribution of the 400 uh, dimensional series into the future. Okay. Um, at this point, uh, somebody told me that was, this was a 45 minutes talk, or I saw that on the website. At this point, I took out 18 slides with lots of examples uh, because this was a slightly longer talk. Um, and this is, this is just from one paper in, that was published in the uh, Applied Stochastic Models in Business and Industry with a, a current and a past student. Uh, Joshi Nakajima is at the Bank of Japan. He's going on secondment to the International Settlement Bank in Basel. Uh, we, these are just points of entree for anybody that may be interested, in particular to the Kaleski volatility modeling in macroeconomics, because that's really, um, that wasn't a macroeconomic example, but that's what that was really uh, um, pulling together in interesting ways. Um, an earlier paper has some, some fairly substantial macroeconomic uh, applications that drive it. And then there are other kinds of applications in digital signal processing. This is where we have some EEG data sets and so forth and forthcoming in the uh, um, proceedings of the, uh, one of the, the best Bayesian meeting, annual meetings in the world, the Brazilian uh, uh, Bayesian Statistics Society. Okay, so some ideas, but nothing, nothing new methodologically really. Uh, not, well, some new things, but nothing, nothing substantially um, 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 new. Just to summarize then, so we're, we're heading towards these goals of saying, well, life is getting bigger and faster. I want to do things um, sensitively in terms of modeling, and I want customized models uh, in each of the dimensions. So let's break everything up and do, do what we used to do in the old days, do some mathematics, do simple, simple uh, linear Gaussian time series on univariate data. Uh, let's then have the ability to link that back to um, flexible models of cross-series structure contemporaneously. Um, if we happen to live in the triangular gamma world, we are done, okay? Decoupled series get recoupled, and then as you move ahead in time, um, uh, uh, you decouple, recouple each day. But let me get back to this point. Otherwise, this would be a very short talk. <laughs> um, what about this point? I'm now going to look at 400 daily stock price data. How am I going to choose an ordering? In one of those papers, we had 13 dimensions. And we played a game by saying, well, we can take all possible orderings, fit the model to each of them, and weight them, and think about you know, how they compare. Well, I, you know, you can't, you can't do that. And the order matters. The order matters. And when we imagine going higher in dimension, uh, it's just, you know, I just can't think about it. Okay? And the reviewers of every journal would say, well, how do you choose this order? Well, look, here's the same analysis. I reversed the order. Look, there are some similarities. There are some differences. Okay? Unless there's theory that's driving the choice. And in some, some areas, there will be. Okay? Low dimensional macroeconomic systems, you know, it's a nice way to think about comparing economist one's theory of the world with economist two's theory of the world. Okay? So let's go back to the general case and think about how to do with that. Now I'm going to be introducing some buzzwords, nothing new, but some of the machine learning people will like, um, in order to help us follow the same sort of line of thinking. Um, with computational methodology that allows us to, to proceed uh, in a decouple, recouple fo format when it's non-triangular. We call these SGDLMs, Simultaneous Graphic Dynamic Models. I'm sorry, there should be a, a, there's got to be an L in there, right? Dynamic linear models, conditionally linear, conditionally Gaussian. So this is the picture to bear in mind. <clears throat> this, is, this is 200 series, this is um, just to illustrate it. Very, very sparse. Parsimony. We don't, we don't want lots of predictors of every series. We'll be overfitting madly. Um, 
And we'll go back to the original notation of simultaneous parents for the, for, the, for the cross series structure. And I'm adding some notation. This is the last bit, I promise, that these conditionally independent, assumedly conditionally independent uh, innovation terms, error terms here, will have variances one over lambda. Okay, so that diagonal matrix lambda, lambda t is the diagonal matrix of the precision. I introduced the matrix earlier, they're just the diagonal elements. Okay, oh, I just, I just fibbed because there's a bit more notation. I'm going to put the state vector theta jt, which comprises the catenation of phi and gamma. There's one of those for each series, so I'll just put those in a, in a bag, capital theta. That's the set of all state vectors. And the diagonal matrix lambda is the, is the set, is the diagonal matrix of the residual precisions, okay? So theta and lambda is the stuff that we condition on to get a conditional Ga Gaussian system. Well, then we do statistics. And now what we're doing here is standing at time t minus one, looking ahead till tomorrow. If I knew the state, theta t, and the volatilities, lambda t, and of course I do know the history of the world. I know these f's back in time because they are based on past values of the Y series and other information that I know, customized to each series. So this will be a multivariate distribution, a multivariate uh, uh, a set of uh, univariate uh, normal distributions coming from here. And if you write down the, the, the joint density, it, it, it is this. this is what it looks like. So I love to do this. If you ignore that term, okay, it's a set of conditionally independent, conditionally linear Gaussian models. It's a set of decoupled models. So looking ahead, I've got a prior uh, today, t minus one, I've got a posterior for the thetas and lambdas based on the history, which defines my prior for tomorrow. So now what I'm gonna do is take my prior for theta and lambda and update it with this likelihood function. So that's the one step filtering calculation I need to do. In the triangular case, that was analytic conjugate priors. In this case, it's not because of this determinantal factor. It's some positive number on each, on each point in this complicated space that distorts this lovely decoupled, this, this lovely likelihood function for the, for the state vector and the volatility matrix, which has the form of a set of M decoupled conditional linear models. So wouldn't it be nice if that determinant went away. <laughs> okay, so that's the way to think. And I'm gonna say, well, when gamma is very, very sparse, this nearly goes away. Okay. So now I'm getting to, into uh, comp statistical computation to enable that prior to posterior update generally based on that sort of principle that I'll be building, I'm building a big model with a lot of sparsity in gamma. And in those cases, this determinant factor will be quote well behaved and we'll, we'll look into that. Okay, so let's take this picture for example. Well, <clears throat> I, I noted here, we've already done this. If gamma happened to be diagonal, I, I'm sorry, if gamma happened to be triangular, then the determinant of I minus gamma is one. Remember the diagonal of gamma is zero. So we know in that case, the determinant factor goes away. It's constant. So it's conjugate updating. Now let's look at this case. If gamma looks like this, I minus gamma looks like this with ones down the diagonal, and this last series of maybe 50 rows here, well, there's a sort of sub-triangular uh, block down here. So that doesn't contribute to the determinant. That just contributes one to the determinant. And the sparser this gets, there are, there are, I'm trying to remember the name, I should have it on the slides, but I don't. Um, who's a MATLAB user? Well, that's surprising, actually. Who deals with sparse linear algebra? Well, that's really surprising. This is a Turing Institute. <laughs> <laughs> so all of the guts of, not all of the guts, a lot of the guts of the MATLAB implementations of sparse linear algebra I, I, I apologize for forgetting the name of the fellow that, that drove it for many years. He's in the University of Florida in applied mathematics. Okay. He's got some beautiful theorems about, about sparse linear algebra. And one of them says, um, if you've got a sparse matrix A, 
what about the sparsity of A transpose A? Okay. And if A has a diagonal of ones, um, what about the determinant of A transpose A? Okay, so he's got some theorems that are useful here. Okay, are they practically useful in statistical methodology? Probably, but I haven't been able to figure that out yet. Okay, they just give you a good flavor for how as the number of non-zero elements goes down, okay, the determinant gets closer to one. Okay, but the problem is that here we are at each time, and our determinant is on a particular state, set of state parameters and volatilities, okay? And the numbers matter in those theorems to get anything useful. But there's some, 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 some big O theorems there that might be interesting to some people that might wanna look into this. So the idea is in sparser and sparser problems, um, this positive number everywhere, this, this fun positive function on this state, state space, um, it, it's not going to be radical, okay? It's going to be varying about one. And if it does vary wildly, then, then you know you've got to think hard, okay? So that's the, that's the basic idea. So what we're going to ba basically do then is say, well, if that's the case, if <coughs> that is the case, then this set of decoupled DLMs is going to be a, a good starting point as an approximation to give you the posterior for tomorrow, uh, for, uh, based on tomorrow's data, okay? It's gonna be a starting point because it's gonna be almost the posterior, okay? So use them and then you have access to what we have ac access to in the triangular case. But then you're, you've got to do probability theory. You've got to make sure you take into account the fact that that determinant is not in fact <coughs> one. And what we have here, decouple, recouple, now we're using the term in connection with statistical computation to get to the posterior distribution. And we'll use important sampling and variational Bayes, that was the example I was referring to earlier, uh, to do this one step update. And I'll, the next two slides uh, speak to that. Sidebar variational Bayes, the particular form of variational Bayes we're using here is just straightforward mean field approximation, which was the first style of variational Bayes brought into statistics, into Bayesian statistics for posterior approximation. Complicated posterior, pretend it's a product of normal distributions. Find the best set of normal distributions, for example, okay? All right, so when you do something and, and you think it's worth publishing, give it a name, you know? For 45 years before variational Bayes came into the statistical lexicon, we just called it approximation. <laughs> but that doesn't sound as fancy and it's much better to have something fancy in the title of your paper and your grants because people, people respond to sexy names. <clears throat> okay, decouple. So here we're at time t minus one, looking ahead to tomorrow's prices. We've got a set of decoupled models. Let's pretend we're in conjugate distributions. We can evolve them one step, we can forecast synthetic futures, right? That's what we do in the triangular case, just in parallel. But then we've got to forecast coherently, okay? So we'll pull them together, um, forecasting the states, the thetas and the, and the lambdas. Then we pull them together to recouple, to get, I put stars on there to denote the fact that this could be five steps ahead, or one, two, three, four, and five steps ahead. Uh, to get simulated values from the prior for the regression, multivariate regression vector and the volatility matrix so that we can then feed in to forecast the future of the series, okay? If we're in that conjugate prior, at, uh, conjugate posterior stage at, at, at time t, uh, time t minus one. Okay, and then we move ahead to tomorrow and we see the prices at four o'clock, uh, New York time. So now we've got to update that set of conjugate priors, decoupled conjugate priors, to the, to the non-independent, to the complicated uh, uh, structured posterior for that full set of states and volatilities across the series. We've got to do Bayes' theorem. And we know from three slides ago that the posterior is the prior. Well, that's conjugate to that set of independent normal decoupled likelihood components. So that gives us a set of decoupled conditionally independent conjugate posteriors across the series. 
But there's a, a complication. We've got this little piece to take care of. Okay. And I said, well, in good cases, this will be very, very close to 1. It won't be wildly varying. In bad cases, it will be, and we want to figure out if we've got a good case or a bad case. Well, this is an example where this is a context which is some of you may teach simulation. In statistics, when we teach simulation, when I teach simulation, important sampling, this is the sort of setup that I want to start. I take this known set, in this case a set of normal inverse gamma distributions, things that we know, can evaluate, can easily simulate from, and we, in a good case, it's a good approximation to the full posterior. And the posterior is just that multiplied by a correction factor. So that's the canonical setup for important sampling. We simulate from these conjugate forms, decoupled in parallel, it's parallel, GPU, okay, on each of the simulated sets of thetas and lambdas. So one simulation gives you one value of the theta set and one value of the lambda matrix. You don't need uh, all of it, you just need the gammas. Find out what that number is on each of those 10,000 samples from that set of conjugate posteriors. That's 10,000 numbers. Make them add up to one. That's a set of probabilities on those simula simulated values. That's your important sample, a discrete distribution to approximate the posterior. Okay? And then you do whatever you want to do, posterior inference or anything else you want to do, uh, on that important sampling. So that represents the complicated dependencies amongst all of the states and volatilities that this determinantal factor induces. Then we've got to move ahead to the next time point, t plus 1, because we're doing this sequentially in time. Time's burning. We've got to move ahead fast. Daily data it's not, but in other contexts it is. So then we've got to say, well, look, if I want to do this, if I want to play this game, tomorrow I've got to be in the same position I was at the start of today with a set of decoupled conjugate posteriors. So that important sample-based posterior has to be morphed to a set of conjugate forms. Okay? Mean field variational base. Okay? Oh. Closest callback Leibler approximation, as we used to call it in, in the old days. Okay? So take that important sample, that simulation-based posterior, and match it to the set of decoupled analytic forms that you want. And the important sampling weights are just the values of this complicating determinant. And if they're all, they're all sort of uniform, that's a good important sample. Best case, the weights are all 1 over 10,000. You've got a random sample. And how far away you are from that random sample is simply a function of this determinant factor. Okay. So by looking at those weights, you get to assess whether you're in a good case or a bad case. Okay. Um, there's a measure, various ways to measure effectiveness of important sampling in, in single numbers. Effective sample size, it's the reciprocal of the sum of the squared weights in one definition. Okay. If it's close to 10,000, if your target sample size is 10,000, then that's a good case the determinant is going to be very stable, and vice versa. There's also some theory here <clears throat> that relates um, the entropy and the minimization, the variational Bayes part to the important sampling, but that's for anybody that's interested in questions, perhaps. But I will give you some pictures that help us understand how to look at these numbers, among others, and some insights into how we're thinking, how we're using them and thinking about using them. So the important sampling then, sample is then used to define a set of conjugate posteriors for the next stage. We're decoupled and we move on. We complete the time t minus 1 to time t and on to time t plus 1 uh, process. Let me give you the example, uh, an example. Um, where is my chair lady? Okay. Oh, she's right here. I was just conscious of the time. So what is, is there? About five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Okay. I'll have to skip some of the example. You don't care about money, right? I'll skip the portfolio analysis. <laughs> So these are uh, 400 stocks. The period of time here, we wanted the longest period of time with a, a good number of stocks. So these are the 400 companies. This is as far back as we could go to get um, 400 companies. If we had more time, then some of these companies didn't exist. Uh, details are not so important. This, I, 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 we model, in practice, we model log prices, OK? Because momentum is, is critical in, in, in daily data over two or three days. But this was for a publication, so we modeled um, 
differences, uh, uh, log differences, standard sort of returns. Uh, played about with some training data and then just run the model forward in time, forecasting and running portfolios on a daily basis. Okay. It's actually 401 because the portfolios were constructed, as, we've got a whole set of a dozen portfolios to compare. They were constructed to be neutral in expectation to the S&P index itself. Because everybody can just go and buy the index. And if... So it's 401 dimensional with the S&P as the last one. <clears throat> um, I'll skip through what the models are. The, they're not very interest, these are not very interesting models. Well, let me say, since they're on the slide. So the first model says, well, there's, there's a regression, there's no regression. It's just a, a wobbling mean in returns. The second one builds in some short-term momentum, basically an average of the forecast errors at the last two time points. These are the decoupled models. Um, and we, our paper com uh, the papers compare it with really the standard Bayesian model for volatility matrices, which is the Wishart <coughs> stochastic process model, um, which only works when they all have the same predictors. But it, it doesn't, it's not really that good in more than a few dimensions anyway, because it's based on Wishart distributions and they are very constraining, right? <laughs> One degree of freedom, whatever the dimension you're in, okay? Um, okay, we've got a whole number of other models, more practical models where there are very customized predictors in some of the series, some volatility predictors, uh, interest rate measures, and other things that are coming in there as well. But uh, the, the pictures today are not for that. <clears throat> so a number of you will be interested in questions of model specification and structure search, if you like. Um, all right. And so that's the simultaneous parental sets as well as the other things in X, okay? That's a whole other talk. Okay. What I'm not, what we're not doing is, is this, for a whole variety of reasons. Okay. One being dimension. Okay. More importantly, in this particular context, in this application, all we care about is forecasting and decisions based on that forecast. Okay. Forecast distributions to feed Bayesian decision analysis to do portfolios. We don't care who the simultaneous parents of Citibank are. We're not interested in learning structure. We might take five simultaneous parents for Citibank and see how well they do. And I can then, I, I know, with probability as close as I get to one, point nine, 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 nine. I can then take those five and replace them with five others and do basically the same job. Capturing market segmentation effects, okay, finance industry effects. Uh, okay, political announcement effects, okay, national euphoria effects at the end of June 2016. Um, so we don't care about who's, par who's, who's parenting whom. We care about good predictions, okay. But we do lots of interesting things, I think they're interesting, to deal with monitoring parental choices and refreshing them day by day and learning about them. This is a hard area with lots of interesting research questions, statistical and comp statistical computation. Okay, so we do have something going on to, 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 to address that. Okay. Um, let me skip through this since uh, my, my chair is, um, is pushing me. Sparse models do better in terms of decisions when you're working in a portfolio context. But I want to spend the last two or three minutes on, on this more sort of, uh, in part technical aspect, but it's also very, very topical and, uh, and may interest some of you. So when you make an approximation, you have, to, you have to figure out how good it is, okay? So here we are going along day by day through the test period, okay? We have an important sample at each day, and the effective sample size is one measure. Uh, one measure. It doesn't tell you how good it is, but it can tell you how bad it is. So this is just from a vignette when the actual sample size was 5,000. And the effective sample size running through 2003 up to 2007 was about 95%, okay, 90%, 90%. And then when the recession hit, it, it sort of breaks down and, and you know, in, in 2008 it comes down to 60% of, of, uh, of that level, okay? So anybody that does simulation knows this is, this is pretty good. If the effective sample size suddenly halves, then take 5,000 and make another 5,000, so you've got 10,000, okay? So your effective sample is 5,000, okay? 
So this is a way to monitor and trigger an intervention. Okay? And you know, it lines up with recessionary events of various kinds. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier there's some theory relating the variational base part of this, the callback library, the entropy sort of part of this, with the important sampling, which as far as I know has not really been, been out there, um, although it's probably known. And you can see that the entropy, how good an approximation that set of decoupled models is for the simulation-based posterior at each time, well, that's good down here, and then it breaks down up here. The distance gets bigger. The divergence gets bigger. It's not a distance. Okay, so that's the recoupling step. That's the decoupling step, and, and they, both, they both are one way, and there are lots of other ways of, of monitoring the, the approximation accuracy. Um, of course, if you're actually using models, you know, you, you're monitoring it down here, and when this, this hits, then you stop, and you've got 24 hours. You do something. <laughs> you change the model. You intervene. Something has, has you've learned something, all right? Things has been, have been very stable, uh, but now things are moving out of, out of line. Same picture. The, the red is the, is the entropy. I, I've called it the Gruber West Financial Stress Index. Lutz Gruber is a co-author on this work, a uh, recent PhD student at the Technical University of Munich. And what I've overlaid there in the blue curve is the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank's Financial Stress Index, which has been around a long time and is one of a number, a small number, of uh, avidly consumed uh, measures. They revise it on a weekly basis. It's uh, some function of some bond spreads and uh, exchange rates, a couple of other things. Very simple metric. And banks and companies and economists look at this all the time, okay? And you can see these things sort of line up in interesting ways. Let me put a few labels on there for you. Um, everybody here, some people in the U.S. don't know about this. Everybody here knows that, uh, that uh, well, gold was going up substantially several months before this. So it, the signals were there earlier. This is Northern Rock bailout. Um, this is when the, the U.S. Congress actually decided a year and a half late to, 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 to act, the National Economic Stimulus Act. Um, that's the beginning of the Euro crisis, what was then called, thereafter called the Euro crisis, with the, with the first stepping in by the ECB. And this was, um, this was when uh, the US lost its AAA plus credit rating. So what we have is an entropy measure. It's a purely statistical number that says how good or how, how, how bad um, our exact posterior from the decoupled posteriors uh, uh, match. And we lead the Fed index, okay? You can't see it from there, but we lead it. And we got it on a daily basis. Nothing to do with the financial sector. And this is now becoming very fashionable in, in econometrics and finance that people are beginning to weave together more and more fine level financial information, like stock prices, into macroeconomic models and vice versa, okay? And I think there's a lot of opportunity to begin to bring in market-based information um, in, in this way. We've got 400 dimensions, 400 series, each with their own pieces of the parameter space. Well, we can decouple callback libraries into 400 dimensions, or any sector, any set of stock series. So we can pull out of the statistical analysis all kinds of measures like this. We've done a lot of that. Some of them are completely stable. Okay? Some of them, some you wouldn't expect, uh, show some lead of, of, of these known events. So the ability to take, this is not very big and complicated data and digest it. I'm not talking like a data miner or a data organizer. You know, we know what these numbers mean. And they can point us to pieces of the system, the complicated system here, uh, differentially, uh, where some action may be needed in the model. Um, in the main, if you can keep things stable, uh, protect those, don't change everything, just look for where the action is. Um, so that is an idea. We're working a lot with a couple of central banks with models where the interest is to scale macroeconomic forecasting models to 150 or so macroeconomic time series. Okay? And, uh, and that's, uh, this, this sort of idea is, is, is becoming of interest there. Okay. So these are, I won't read the words since they are, uh, they're the same from an earlier slide. I simply added this, this star that um, if you want to break out of the, of, of the, of the triangular case, then um, this is one way to think about doing it. And that's the main benefit, scalability, uh, linear in, the, in terms of the number of uh, series you have. Um, 
And conceptually, uh, we know what we're doing because we're building univariate time series. Computationally, there's no MCMC. I'm not spending 99.5% of the effort, and my students and postdocs aren't either, in trying to understand how bad MCMC is in a, in a complicated model. We're simply using direct simulation, important sampling. Okay? Um, and some of the work, um, uh, there's several other examples. Um, it's obvious that a GPU context is very, very nice for fitting these models. And there's a little bit of theory that's been uncovered um, that may interest some people uh, relating variational Bayes to important sampling and, and back. And my chair has uh, stood up, so I should sit down, but I have to introduce these three uh, collaborators. Uh, Zoe worked a lot on the dynamic dependence networks in her thesis. Uh, she will come back to academic research in a, in a while, I, I hope. Um, she's in a group uh, run by one of my past PhD students, which now has, I think, four of them in Chicago. Uh, we'll have dinner next week. Um, Amy was an undergraduate at Duke who did a, a, a senior thesis, a third year, fourth year a thesis uh, on multivariate forecasting with me, and she uh, went out to work for a couple of years, and she did come back. She's now a PhD student. Uh, Lutz uh, will, be, uh, will be moving back very soon. Um, He's currently working at Quantco in, in Cologne. And um, these papers are available on, on my website or an archive. And I, I haven't got a list of references to other people's work because they're all in, in these papers for anybody that's interested. Thanks for your attention, and thanks for, your, <coughs> for the liberty of a few extra minutes. And thank you for uh, those of you that are still sitting there remotely. Thank you. Uh, thanks for a very interesting talk. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. If you want to ask a question, remember to use the mic, please. And for those of you that are live streaming, you can type a question in the comment section. And do they appear on here? Uh, no. Thank you, Phil. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, I'm puzzling a little bit about the interpretation of your general model. Um, because unless, if you just think of a t single time slot, ignore the past, and you've got these uh, simultaneous equations. Um, now, unless all the variables are completely independent of each other, I can't interpret your residuals uh, as being the conditional, uh, the residual based on all the other y's. No. Oh. Uh, so, so they're simultaneous equations. They're not what we have become accustomed to calling well, these 30 years nearly, complete conditional distributions. So the interpretation is straightforward. That's the whole point. But just just take one important. series at a time. The residual is the residual in that series <coughs> if you knew tomorrow's values of the simultaneous parents. Okay? It's not a complete, yes, it's, not a, it's a simultaneous specification. Yeah. Okay. The, well, the other I, way. I've always, I've, I, all I can say, I've always had trouble with interpreting that model because the residuals are not. Is, the, 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 the triangular case is fine. Yes. So go, go the other way. Start with the precision matrix, the multivariate distribution, and say, here's a factorization of the precision matrix. Oh, it has this form. It's a sparse factorization with this gamma. Okay. So think about it like a. So yeah. I, I'm worried about interpretability. I mean, as a black box model, it's fine. I'm just worried it's about not its a black interpretation. Box model. It's a set of, of customized subjective probability models for each of the series individually, independently. That's the interpretation. <coughs> well, as you say, this is a customized model. How do you know it fits the data well or not? Oh, thanks, Raj. I'll put one of the slides that I had to skip. <laughs> um, so that's a big question. Okay, so uh, some of you don't know me. Uh, so the business of forward sequential modeling, learning, forecasting, making decisions, it's not a black box. There are people in that box. Something happens, oh, I've got to change things. Okay, so that's a big question, and that's, that's really the answer. Now, of course, other, you, you know, you, statistics then applies. If you want to build a different model, with different simultaneous parents, compare it, okay? To the specific technicality, um, on one piece, 
just just a little tiny vignette. You know, this is a, a, a long a long story if we want to get into it. Um, <clears throat> I spent some time talking about the good cases, when, and then I showed you the risk indices which highlighted some, some not so good cases. Um, one model checking uh, tool that we're all fond of is to look at residuals. One step ahead, forecast errors. Okay, Are they noise? Is the structure in them? If there is, what am I missing? What can I bring in to model that structure? Uh, do they look symmetric? Do they look sort of kind of Gaussian. If you're anybody that's been involved in volatility modeling time series knows that realized one step of forecast errors are always going to be fat tailed. They're sort of T things, not, 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 not Gaussian. And this slide, since I had it in there, I, I didn't use it, takes each of those series, so Citibank at time T, uh, and says, well, what was the realized uh, forecast error? Okay. And what was the distribution, that, the predictive distribution for that? Uh, from yesterday, and use that distribution function to transform to 0, 1, okay? And if the model is perfect, these are uniform, okay? Right, Phil? You've done some of this. And then look at them across all time for Citibank and then across all series, okay? And when you do this in finance, you always get the slightly leptocurtic shape. If you said, well, we're in a good circumstance, so rather than doing this, let me ignore that determinant term. Just ignore it. This is what David Heckerman's group were doing in the 90s. Okay? They were saying, it's too hard to build a multivariate system, so let's just build a set of conditionally independent univariate systems. Let's do our best job to predict Citibank and our best job to predict AT&T. Okay? Okay? And this simply shows you the effect in this example of doing that. So, the, what should be uniform if you, if you are that cavalier looks much less like a uniform when you apply the recoupling, okay? So we do residual analysis, forecast residuals, one step ahead forecast residuals analysis. We do a lot of, and you can do a lot of model uncertainty with comparing different models in this framework. In some of those papers, we do that. Uh, we can talk about you know, the, the, the rights and the wrongs of that. But raw forecast accuracy and in portfolios, realized returns and other measures, you know, risk measures and other characteristics of, of realized portfolios uh, come into play. We're not looking for truth. We're looking for good predictive models in this, in this application. This is Jen Seer Lee who's asked, is it possible to circumvent VB but directly to forecast the moments of the time series? I mean, who is that? Sorry? Uh, Jen Seer Lee. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, forecast the moments. So uh, it's, it's hard remotely because I, my answer is a question. <laughs> um, so so, so I'm, I'm just imagining what, what, what the question really means. Um, so forgetting about probability models and just doing, doing moments, means and variance matrices, is, is, is that the question? I'm assuming Jen Sear will. Uh, yeah. Um, so we do compute predictive means and variance matrices and predictive precision matrices. There's some nice theory there as well um, in the triangular case. Um, but for forecasting, we want, I want probabilities. I'm a Bayesian. So I want full probability distributions rather than just means and variances. They're not Gaussian. The predictive distributions are are certainly not Gaussian. They have no name. So I have two questions. One is, uh, ha have you tried to uh, incorporate customized predictors in the volatility matrix? <clears throat> well, here the volatility matrix is defined by the dynamic, the time varying coefficients on the set of simultaneous parents across the series. Okay? So that is customization. There's a very specific structure that is arising from the customized decoupled univariate models. Okay? There are no other exogenous variables, no other x's going into that part of the model. But, but that's an assumption, right? So yes, yeah. in this model. Okay. 
and uh, by the way, thanks for the suggestion. All right. <laughs> but, so, but but let me finish. So the only way I can see that being potentially valuable, but then I'm I have a very narrow response because I haven't thought about it, is to put that into the state space model for the state vectors that define the response to the sim the, what I call the gammas. If there was some feedback, feed forward information to predict the variation over time in the gammas, there might be. Morris Priestley did, published a few papers in the last edition of his book, uh, had a nice final chapter on what he called state dependent uh, time series modeling. Is that right, state dependency? And I remember seeing a talk by him in 1981 when I was a PhD student about this. And uh, my question was, how on earth are you going to fit these models? Okay. Well, of course, we can nowadays, if we want to do big computation. That might be possible without violating my, my main desideratum here, which is that I want to do calculations that I could do in 1981. <laughs> Uh, and uh, is there like any any sort of study on the impact that omitting this determinant might have on the predictive variance? So on the variance for the predictive distribution. All right. Does this have more variance or less variance than this? <laughs> I'll bet more because of this tick up in the tails. Okay. Uh, haven't studied that. Don't know if anybody has yet. Okay. But uh, let me think about the. So you're talking about the what the predictive variance for forecasting the, the actual series. Um, well, it, so um, it, it, who, who does portfolio construction? Has anybody played about with? So standard Markowitz Bayes, Bayesian decision theory to implement portfolios in conditionally Gaussian systems. The optimal decisions at each time point, how you rebalance your portfolio, what you sell, what you buy, et cetera, what you get completely out of, depend in part critically on, theoretically, on the, this precision matrix omega. So it's the omega matrix that drives portfolios. It's, it's, and small changes in omega can have a dramatic effect on the, on the Bayesian decision. Sparsity always wins. I mean, that's a, that's a given because this, these things are highly overparameterized if, if you let them be free. Um, so it's not the variances and covariances. Okay, we look at pictures of estimated volatilities, but for, for the decision, it's, the, it's, it's how well you've characterized the time variation in the precision matrix that really matters. Okay? So that's what I would, I would want to look at rather than the variance. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, any more questions? What's happening with? Um, slightly cryptic, um, and it might be a test of your memory. I think when you were answering the question, you started saying, is this what you mean? Yeah. And the response is yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case, that makes it simple. The answer to the original question is no. <laughs> because I, want pro I already said it, I want probability distributions. This is a, this is, this is a, this is a Bayesian talking. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. And let's thank Mike again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question. And I think we will have wine and cheese here. Yeah? Okay, thank you. I uh, also please remember you can give your feedback through the website. You'll receive an email. You'll receive an email. Please give your feedback um, for the lectures going forward. Thank you.